let me welcome everyone. Uh, today we have uh, Marcin Pawlowski, who is a professor at the University of Gdańsk. So Marcin did his PhD in 2010 with uh, Professor Zhukowski at the University of Gdańsk. Then he moved to the University of Bristol, where he was a postdoctoral fellow of uh, Andreas Winter, as far as I remember, for three years. After that, he came back to, to Gdańsk. And till now, he runs his own group there, also within the International Center for Theory, Theory of Quantum Technologies, which is financed by the Foundation for Polish Science. I would say that Marcin is very successful in his uh, career. He has many interesting achievements, scientific achievements, and I hope he will tell us about some of them. But uh, maybe the most interesting thing that I learned recently is that he is a co-founder of a startup who is going to manufacture quantum devices producing random numbers. So I guess he soon will be rich. And today he will tell us about uh, generation of random numbers uh, uh, by using quantum systems. Okay, Marcin, you can start. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to give this seminar. It's always a pleasure. I wish I could be there in person, but these are interesting times. So I'm here instead. And uh, as uh, Remik said, I'm uh, uh, currently working at the International Center for Theory of Quantum Technologies and uh, I'm a group leader there and my group is in my opinion has in my opinion the best name ever it's Quantum Cyber Security Unit it sounds very science fiction but it's uh, we are in uh, 20, uh, 2020, so this is actually what we are doing right now. There's nothing futuristic about it. This is just this is just our times. And uh, as he, he said, I'm also a co-founder of a company which builds a quantum random number generators. So uh, so this makes me well, at least a little competent to tell about evolution. And I think the random number generators that my company is building are the, uh, are the peak of this uh, evolution. But, uh, well, we will see. I, I will not uh, tell you about them because uh, I want to focus on things which already exist on the market and only in the last slide when I talk about future outlook I will point at the directions in which I feel the field will go and this direction is basically what our company is doing. So, um, in the previous version of this presentation I had a couple of slides at the beginning which were aimed at explaining what is uh, randomness and um, and why there is some confusion about it and why people sometimes misunderstand it but I realized that these slides were only adding to confusion and misunderstanding so since you're all scientists I start with a formula so randomness is, typical, is a property of a random variable and the most uh, common uh, method of measuring is it is by Shannon entropy. And this is a formula for Shannon entropy and uh, variable X here is the variable of which uh, randomness we are measuring and K represents our knowledge. So, um, the, the most important thing when we define the amount of randomness is we need to define in respect to whom this randomness is uh, going to be defined. So for example, let me take a pen and I will write a number on a piece of paper. For me, this number is not random at all. As you see in the second line, uh, random uh, uh, entropy takes values between zero and logarithm of n, and n is the number of uh, of possible values of the random variable. I, I assume it's discrete, and when it's zero, it means there is nothing random at all about this variable. And this number, for me, is obviously not random. 
it is random for you, but um, in a different way. So some of you might know me and you might know that I like some numbers more, some numbers less. Others may not know me, but uh, have brains which work in a similar way that mine does. I pity you, but then you, for you also, it will be easier to guess this number. And um, this is very important because uh, the quality of randomness uh, and the, the, the higher the entropy, the larger quality is extremely important in all the fields that the randomness is used. And the, the most important fields are science, gaming, and cybersecurity. In science, we use randomness mostly to have uh, random samples. So if we test a drug, we would like to pick a random sample of population uh, to, to check if it's, um, if it's working uh, because human body is, is too complex for us uh, to prove the action of a chemical compound uh, on uh, the whole system. Uh, so what we do is we just give this chemical compound to random people and observe uh, their the reaction. But if this randomness is bad, we run into problems. And uh, I have a, a picture by Zach Weiner Smith here, who commented on uh, the fact that most of, not, maybe not most, but a lot of uh, data on so sociology is taken from Scandinavian countries. So here's uh, his picture and uh, here he finds that uh, most of the twins separated at birth like pickled fish. This is be because uh, studies come from Scandinavia and this is how uh, bad randomness can lead to bad results in science. In gaming, the situation is similar. I have a photo here uh, of uh, Robert uh, Mukabe. He's a, a president of Zimbabwe who recently won the top prize in in state run lottery although nothing was proven to him we believe that his k uh, made the entropy for him much smaller than for the average person from zimbabwe and for for cybersecurity i don't have any picture because basically the rest of the presentation is about uh, about what happens if we have bad randomness in cybersecurity and how to guarantee that uh, the quality of our randomness is good so um why randomness is important uh, let let me quote uh, sun tzu uh, the famous uh, military leader and philosopher from China. Uh, more than a two and a half millennia ago, he wrote his famous book, The Art of War. And then uh, he writes that all warfare is based on deception. So basically, he means that our actions should be as random uh, to our opponent as possible. And in his book, which I totally recommend to all of you, uh, he repeats this over and over again in many different forms, but uh, I have one more quote. He says that knowing the enemy enables you to take the offensive and knowing yourself enables you to stand on the defensive. And in the modern cybersecurity terms, it simply means that if I want to attack, if I play the role of an attacker of uh, some cryptographic system, I want to minimize the entropy of, uh, of, uh, of that system. So I want to maximize my knowledge about it. And if I play the role of a defending person, I want to maximize it. So if I have a random number generator, which usually is used to provide some security, I want to be able to say, okay, 
the entropy is very, very large. And I want, also want to be sure that potential adversary will not be able to say that for me, this entropy is very, very small because as I said in the previous slide, and I will repeat it over and over again, the entropy is different for different people. So for the user of the device, it might be different than uh, for some uh, eavesdropper, attacker, or constructor of this uh, device. So uh, randomness in uh, cybersecurity is used mostly for three things. Uh, the most of randomness generated uh, in the world uh, when it comes to say, security application goes for memory allocation. Whenever a computer or any sufficiently complicated device like smartphone, tablet or whatever starts a new process, not even a program, a process, it needs to allocate randomly chosen part of memory for it to run. If this is not chosen randomly, it opens avenue to many hacking attacks. So our- Could I ask a question, please? Oh. Yes, of course. How, how is this definition that you are talking about related, if at all, to the classic Kolmogorov uh, definition of randomness? Um, this is uh, not related at all. Oh, okay, so uh, the, the relation is uh, quite complex and I don't want to uh, speak uh, about Komogorov Ko uh, randomness at all because, um, well, we are talking about a practical thing and as you know, Kolmogorov uh, uh, complexity cannot be, cannot be estimated. It can be, you, you can only find uh, uh, an upper bound for it, uh, never a lower bound. And uh, this makes it impractical as a, as, a, um, as a measure of quality of a device. And what I want to talk about is practical devices used really in practice. So, okay, thanks. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and the second important um, uh, use of randomness is passwords. And passwords are, uh, are very, I will talk more about them later, but what is very interesting in them is that they also should be maximally random from the point of view of a person who is trying to guess them and is not and should not be able to but i should also remember they should be quite easy to remember by uh, by a person who is qualified uh, to to use them but i will focus on uh, randomness used in cryptographic keys because uh, this is where some of the, where, where most of the issues which I want to point at are the most uh, prominent. So I will focus on randomness in cryptographic keys. Okay. First use of, uh, uh, first random number generators were humans and uh, and they are, were really bad on their own. So uh, here on this picture, there is an Enigma machine. And uh, this was uh, probably the first very widely used uh, cryptographic system, which was really difficult to, to break. And uh, it, the important part of it that uh, was that two sides communicating, they had a secret key which was chosen randomly, but also apart from uh, that general key, there was a smaller key, which was used only for this particular message. And this key was generated by the sender of the message every time the device was used. And and uh, this was, and since it was generated by a human, and it was a very short, uh, a very short key, it, it was just three letters long in the standard version, and 
then uh, a lot of people uh, tended to use uh, their names or shortcuts of their names or names of their family or friends or beloved ones or some German words because uh, the, this machine was uh, mostly used by German military and this was one of the avenues which uh, led to uh, this system being cracked. What is really important for us is that the that most of the messages which were cracked at the beginning were Luftwaffe messages and uh, the, the reason is that somehow people uh, in Luftwaffe who communicated using this machine were much less careless about their, their, about their choice of randomness than in the other uh, parts of the uh, German military. So they often used uh, names of their girlfriends and, uh, when, uh, and, uh, and people trying to, to break this machine simply checked every possible uh, German girl name uh, as a key. And although it still didn't, uh, it was not sufficient uh, to, to break this code, it, way, it made uh, things much simpler. So this is one of the important things about humans as sources of randomness. Some, um, some choices of numbers and letters that we make will be more probable than the others. So, um, uh, so for, for, for example, uh, some people, I, I don't, I, I was not able to find them. Yes? Hello? Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot hear the question. The problem was not that they were using Okay, Martin, I think you can continue and uh, because there's some problem. Uh, yes, I, I, I randomly I, I, I'm sorry, I think I will continue because I cannot hear the question. Maybe the best to write it in the chat and then somebody will talk. Uh, yeah, 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 yes. Let's do it uh, like this. And uh, so, so uh, as I was saying, and I can hear you very, very bad. Now you can hear better. No, there is still some problem. Like, can you write your question in the in the chat? No. Oh. Maybe Martin, can you continue? Oh, no. okay. Let, 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 let me continue then. So, uh, so as I say, humans are, this are better sources of randomness on their own, and uh, and uh, some numbers in lotteries are uh, are seen to be more frequent than the others when when chosen by people. So, if you play Polish Lotto, mm -hmm. some people, when they are asked to choose numbers. They will choose some numbers with bigger frequency and some with lower, and the some and the, uh, a lot of numbers will be omitted. But the thing is that another group of people will choose different numbers. So if you look at the aver average uh, probability that a number is chosen in Poland by a person, it's more or less the same for every number. But uh, surprisingly, people are really, really good at uh, generating randomness where, when they are augmented with uh, some device like dice or, or choosing a ball from a pot or, or anything like this. It's, there, there will be still some uh, patterns, but they will be very, very difficult to detect. So. So humans are not that bad at randomness, but the problem is in this, uh, with this is that they are always very slow. So computers right now, when I'm talking, my computer is constantly generating randomness for various purposes. And if I were to uh, roll dice and uh, 
and input this uh, randomness for my computer's purposes, I wouldn't be able to keep the speed if, if, if it was the only thing I were doing. So, so using humans as random number generators is highly impractical. Uh, and there, therefore, just after Second World War, uh, after the failure of randomness in Enigma, people started to use uh, first physical random number generators, which didn't have a human component. And the first uh, case, up to, to my knowledge, is uh, Rand's uh, program from uh, 1947, in which they used a, a device which they called electronic uh, roulette. And uh, this was just an electronic circuit uh, designed to mimic the action of a roulette. And they generated a million random digits, which they publ published in a book. And uh, you can buy it. It's actually now you can buy it on Amazon. And I, and I actually recommend uh, going to the to Amazon and reading the user uh, reviews of this book because some of them are quite hilarious. Uh, what is also interesting about uh, this book is that it was probably the first uh, ebook in history because already, I think, in 1955, uh, there was an, an edition on it, of it on punch cards so that people could enter these punch cards into early computers and uh, random, randomize their, uh, their action. But the problem with this is that this randomness, it, it's, it's, it's actually very good randomness. Uh, we used uh, recently state-of-the-art uh, techniques to check how random these numbers are, and, and they are they, they are okay for, uh, for our current uh, cybersecurity needs. But this is problem. So it's perfect for uh, say scientific purposes and ac actually this book played uh, uh, played a, a big role in uh, scientific uh, research in 20th century but it's not good for cryptographic purposes because if i use uh, some num uh, say numbers from this book as uh, my security key then somebody else who has access to this book can use this too. But that person has to know uh, which um, uh, th that I'm using this book. And this is not always the case. So I want to mention about, um, uh, about a, let's call it a doctrine or a, a, a dogma. Um, of security through obscurity. So usually if I want my protocol to be secure, I will not announce what protocol I'm using. So not only I will keep my key secret, but I will try to keep uh, the, the method of encrypting and decrypting data as secure. This is nowadays it's not uh, commonly used uh, at least not in uh, private sector but still uh, high security agencies like military or uh, intelligence agencies they they uh, they still use this uh, method and and if i am fairly certain that nobody knows my uh, cryptographic protocol, then I am able to use public randomness from public sources. And um, therefore, and th there are these, uh, ob let's call them objects, uh, which, are, uh, which are called randomness beacons. These are sources of randomness which are available on internet. Th there are some organizations which just keep producing random numbers and uh, they use very well certified processes, sometimes even quantum ones, to generate randomness that anybody can use. This is, of course, the public. Is on the book by Rand. Uh, the, the, and this, 
Um, you, you're muted. Are we allowed to ask the question during a seminar or not? Yes, um, you're allowed. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, but you're muted. I cannot hear you. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, I mean, uh, that was my question, whether you hear me. Uh, I, I want just to make a comment about the RAND book of random numbers, because that allow Mark Katz to provide his own definition of what are random numbers. And Mark Katz's definition was that if you will, that if you will, the random numbers are such a numbers that they will appear in a book, the book will never require a corrector. That was a Mark Katz definition of random numbers, and that uh, I believe was in in relation to this Rand book because Mark Katz was involved in publication of that book. I'm sorry, it's not scientific comment, but historical. Thank you. Yeah, but, but it's nice. Thank you. Could I, okay. could I add to it? I was uh, present at the lecture of Mark Katz back in 1975. He he said exactly what Lukas has said, but then added, and can you imagine I've got some random number uh, books with errata? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but that would spoil my argument, so I didn't <laughs> add it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let, 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 let me go further. So, uh, after this uh, first electronic roulette uh, in the uh, 20th century, people started to, to develop more and more uh, random number generators, and uh, they were aimed at producing private randomness. So these random numbers were not put in a book, but instead everybody who wanted secret random numbers had his own device, and this device was producing numbers uh, for the person. And uh, I took uh, part of a Wikipedia page on, um, on physical random number generators, and then they are clearly divided into two categories, classical and quantum one. And uh, this, and this, um, and this uh, division is quite, let's call it, based on philosophy, because it's, when you have an object, it is your choice whether you want to model it with a classical mechanics or maybe some wave mechanics, uh, electrodynamics or quantum theory. And, uh, and uh, depending on the model, this, uh, this will tell you something about its uh, randomness, but you will but basically, if you want to call your device quantum, you can always do this. There is uh, nothing stopping you. So this is a problem. And let me tell you why, the, why, why I think this is a problem. So what we see here is a Samsung Galaxy A quantum. It's, uh, it's uh, the first smartphone, a smartphone which has a quantum random number generator built in. It's uh, developed by SK Telecom. This is a South Korean uh, company which recently acquired uh, shares in ID Quantique. This is a Swiss company which uh, was one of the first companies which started to produce quantum random number generators. And the first idea was quite simple. So there is a laser, laser there is a mirror uh, in the middle, and this mirror is, is basically a beam splitter. So it, it has a property that half of the photons passes through the mirror and half of them gets reflected. And then I have uh, two detectors. And if I send one, I'm in, in the perfect case, I'm going to send one photon. I assume it will not be lost. The, uh, the geometry of this picture is completely wrong. Um, what what is on the right should be up, above. Um, oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I drew this picture and uh, I'm 
I'm a theor uh, theoretician. I don't know how mirrors work really, but um, uh, but, but l l l please forgive. L let me continue. And uh, then, if uh, if one uh, detector uh, registers a photon, then the outcome uh, is zero. If the other, the outcome is one. And uh, we, we repeat this over and over again to generate string of random numbers. But then people who were building this device, engineers thought, okay, we don't actually need two detectors because if one registered a photon, then we know it's not at the other. And if one didn't register in a photon, we know it went the other way, at least in the perfect case. So they changed the idea to the following. And then uh, they, and this was actual, uh, and actually already this was sold in commercially available devices, but then next generation of commercially available devices looked like this, but then people said, okay, in fact, there are losses in the beam. So this mirror is not really necessary if we just make losses big enough so, such that only half of the photons reach APD, a, a, this detector, then mirror is not necessary. So uh, they build something like this. And this is actually the form of the device which is uh, built in, in this uh, Samsung, um, Samsung phone. But then there are also quantum devices which look like this because uh, those photodiodes they they have uh, they register also dark counts. So sometimes they say that they register a photon when they did not. So so basically we don't need a laser diode at all. And there are commercially available devices of this sort. But then, if you see the second point in the classical uh, random number generators, basically this is just noise in the photodiode. So it's really difficult to say whether a quantum, rand uh, whether a random number generator should be called quantum or not, at least in this form. But there are some, uh, but we know that there are some processes which do not have classical explanation, for example, uh, violation of Bell inequalities. And therefore, if a device demonstrates that such a process happens there, the, only then they, they can be called purely quantum. And why, why, I, why I'm uh, very particular can about- can I, can I interrupt again and I say that, hmm? well, I mean, in the, in the Nobel Prize lecture by Pierre Curie, there is this famous statement uh, about the, the radioactive decay, and the, that it is a ra that the radioactive decay is a truly random process. And by the way, this is this famous statement in the lecture. A Nobel Prize lecture by Pierre Curie saying that this idea is only due to the Maria Skłodowska Curie because both gentlemen, Pierre Curie and uh, his mentor, were afraid to say such a hearsay at the beginning of the 20th century. So we have a definition of a quantum random noise, it's a radioactive decay. Um, but then, then there is a problem, and this, uh, this is actually uh, what this slide is about. How do I know that my device is really measuring radioactive decay? This, I can be fairly sure if uh, I actually build this device. But if I bought it from a source which I do not trust, it can uh, do anything. And uh, this, and actually, rigging, uh, uh, rigging random number generators is uh, one of, uh, is basically the most common vector of attacks on cryptographic systems. So let me show you an example. 
This uh, thing is a Intel's ID bridge processor and it's first processor uh, for a classical computer, which had an inbuilt physical random number generator as a separate part of the whole processor. Uh, it was uh, supposed to generate numbers, uh, basically by measuring thermal noise of the rest of the processor. Uh, but then some researchers showed that if you take this part of processor and it's, it's built of billions of transistors, and then you change dopant levels in only a few of the transistors, then this will be not possible to detect at all. But then if you do this, then the behavior of the machine will look random, but will not be random to that person who changed the dopant levels. So if um, um, this, uh, this processor is manufactured in some uh, uh, in some factory somewhere in Asia where a malicious party can enter and change the behavior uh, of the robot which is actually building this, it will be almost impossible to detect. Even under microscope, a modified device looks exactly like unmodified device and this is not secure. And uh, also, uh, well, since I'm talking about vendors do not, sh who should not be trusted, let me go back to the Enigma machine and uh, remind you that after the Second World War, it was sold by the British to many of their former colonies who, uh, under the pretense that it's still secure. And uh, for example, India was using it until 70s and uh, its government communications were uh, totally transparent to the British. Also, uh, in uh, one of the leaks of Robert Snowden, he points out at, uh, a scheme by American National Security Agency who designed a pseudo-random number generator, which they only could crack and then Pay, they paid RSA Securities, the biggest security company in the world, to you set it as a default in their devices. And also, uh, quite recently, there, there was this uh, whole affair with uh, Huawei um, installing backdoors in their routers. So we should not trust uh, the device, especially if we didn't believe it ourselves. And the other problem is entropy estimation. So if you have a source of um, ra randomness, it's never perfect. And the, the randomness is never actually really good. So in order to have uh, uh, to have random numbers with uh, nice properties, for example, the same frequency of zeros and ones, we use randomness extractors. So we take uh, entropy, uh, we, we take some random sequence with low entropy, we add some extra randomness, which can, which can be public randomness. Uh, the important thing is, is that it should be independent from the source, so we can use, for example, two independent random numbers generators. This, this is what is typically done in high security applications. And then we get good randomness. But this randomness extractor is nothing, uh, nothing more than a function. And this function, to work correctly, it needs as an input H. H being the quality of randomness. If I overestimate the quality of my randomness, there is no proof that this randomness extractor will increase the randomness of, uh, from the source of entropy. Actually, it might decrease it. So this is what happens. I have uh, 
I oh I, I'm sorry I lost the title of the paper but I have DOI so you, you can check it so uh, in this uh, plot you can uh, see the uh, you can see the after pulse probability of an avalanche photodiode. So if I have a detector like in uh, this previous case, mm -hmm. my avalanche photodiode is supposed to produce a sequence of zeros and ones. And uh, if it registered a photon in a given time slot, it is primed and it has a slightly higher probability to register a photon in the next time slot. And, um, and the people who design, uh, uh, who design uh, random number generators take this into the account and you, uh, when they estimate the entropy and then onboard randomness extractors, use this entropy uh, you, you you use uh, use this entropy estimate to amplify randomness but then in a, one of the commercially available devices they only looked at one preceding pulse but if you look at more pulses then uh, then the then the behavior of the of the photodiode changes and you can actually uh, predict what, whether it will register a photon or, or not with a higher probability so this randomness should be uh, should be reduced and i actually uh, people uh, behind this paper they wrote uh, uh, to one of the companies uh, we which device they have been testing to get this plot and uh, this uh, company update, updated their uh, the software in their device um, uh, to compensate for lower amount of randomness but you see um, that this is a problem because also uh, the devices deteriorate over time and uh, if you if you want to be sure that your device is working properly you have to take into the account that the source the entropy source cannot be as reliable in five years as it is now it also may be less reliable reliable in different circumstances so for example uh, when uh, uh, th there was a this uh, physical random number generator, which was even used by NATO military. And uh, some people have shown that it stops producing good randomness if its temperature falls below minus 30 degrees. So if you want to have a good random number generator, you should be able somehow to estimate its entropy in the real time and uh, and this is what quantum devices can do i'm sorry i'm taking very long so i will go much f faster now because now this is something you you all know so these are bell inequalities and they can be used as a source of randomness so uh, bell test uh, uh, is uh, an experiment where two separate parties share an entangled state. They choose some settings. These are uh, zeros and ones and get some outcomes. And this below is uh, a bell inequality. And if it's violated, we know that something purely non-classical is happening. And in this paper, they have shown that this can be used uh, for um, generating random numbers and also that the uh, that the oh i'm sorry that the uh, entropy uh, depends on uh, on the violation of bell inequality note that um uh, here what they estimate is not shannon entropy but mean entropy which is uh, which is better for uh, 
uh, some other uh, purposes of estimating randomness, but let, let, let's not go into this. So, uh, what they show is that as long as you violate Bell inequality, we know that the outcomes cannot be random, uh, must be at least a little random. And the important thing is that we do not need to assume anything about the devices which were used. We only look at probability distribution, which is uh, very convenient because now one device can be supplied by Huawei, the other by American NSA, and even if they collaborate, there is nothing uh, they can do to learn our, uh, our random numbers. Um, and then also, um, but, but uh, I also want to point out, point uh, to a thing that in order to estimate this um, Bell inequality, you need to input some randomness because in order for this to work, X and Y have to be random. So it looks like a circular argument because you need randomness to produce randomness. But there are uh, two things. First of all, X and Y can be public randomness. So any randomness generated after these devices was built and independent from the states can be used. And uh, we don't care if anybody finds this out. Randomness in X and Y will be independent of randomness in A and B. So this is, um, this is uh, very, very nice and also we need much less randomness for X and Y than we get from A and B. So uh, I, I actually we can feed back randomness generated here back in this device and keep it going. It's not, I, right now I'm a little oversimplifying, but if uh, somebody is interested in this process, I can talk about this later. And also, if we have only access to bad randomness for X and Y, Bell tests can be used to amplify the quality of randomness. And this is a process which was shown to be impossible in a classical uh, case. So this is one of the things, uh, uh, one of the cases where quantum theory really gives us advantage over classical ones. And let me, quickly uh, now advertise one of my papers. This is one of, I think one of my favorite uh, papers because the result is quite funny. We show there that it is in principle possible to have secure cryptography without, run, without any randomness at all, which was thought to be impossible, but we point out to, to the thing, thing that if a message that I want to communicate to you is already known by the adversary, then there is no point in adversary attacking this. But if it is not known by the adversary, then from her point of view, and this is the only thing that counts for, uh, uh, for security, there is some randomness in it. So here in this paper, we show that there exists a protocol which will take my message as a sort of randomness, generate the key to, uh, in, with which this message will be encoded and sent um, and this can be used for secure cryptography. So, and this also shows that humans, and this is humans who generated this message, can still be used as sources of randomness, even in uh, quantum cryptography. Okay, now I, 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 I see that I don't have much time. So uh, let me quickly tell you about semi-device independent protocols. These are protocols which we invented uh, to, uh, to cope with the problem that uh, using Bell tests is uh, very time 
and uh, money consuming. So they, these devices are slow, big and expensive. And this is not what we need. So with in semi-device independent protocols, you also don't want to assume much about your devices. You only choose uh, to, be, to make one small assumption. The first idea was to assume that the Hilbert space dimension of the communicated system is bounded from above and uh, we, we first use it for quantum cryptography, but later we found that it can be also used for randomness generation. But then there uh, some people choose other assumptions and um, the most interesting ones are where you only assume that your devices produces two states, two quantum states, which are not orthogonal, or that there may be more than two. And I would like to especially point out at the second of these papers, because this is a very beautiful idea, in my opinion, when uh, people use an unambiguous state discrimination. And uh, this is a process which lets you distinguish non-orthogonal states with certainty. But still, randomness can be generated in this process because if you can uh, distinguish them with certainty, then you can also very well estimate the probability with which uh, the procedure will return you inconclusive result. It, because this procedure has two results if you distinguish between two states, state one, state two, or I don't know. And then uh, this, the frequency of this I don't knows can be used as a randomness source. Okay, and finally, I'm, I want to sh tell you the outlook. So this is what my company is doing. So we need devices which are fast, small, and cheap. They, they need to be small because right now, the biggest users of uh, random numbers are devices from the Internet of Things. So uh, Bluetooth devices, uh, routers, uh, smartphones, th things like this. So, the, and they need a lot of good randomness. And bell, bell tests are too difficult and do not provide full security because uh, well, I, I didn't uh, speak about this uh, earlier, but uh, there is always a probability that there is, a, say, radio installed in your device, which sends um, which sends all its results uh, to the adversary. And uh, of course, the device can be easily opened and check if there is a radio or not. But then, if part of the security proof says you need to open your devices, then they are not really fully device independent. I think like fully device independence does not exist. So as I say, there are always these hidden assumptions. And the question is uh, that we should be able to deal with them. And the certification will not it's never done by the end user. It will be done by organization. So I need to design a device which I can give to an organization which will certify that this is really good device. And then they will open it and play with it. They will not be able uh, to check if all the transistors in the device are really doped like I advertise. But this is not a problem. As I told you, the, the quantum device, which can uh, be made to generate good quality randomness with uh, moderate assumptions. So this is uh, what I think the future is, that uh, instead of looking, making one general assumption, say about the dimension of the system or, or overlap of quantum states, we will simply say, look, this is my device, it's constructed like this. Here is a beam splitter. I don't, I don't tell you what are, the, what are its parameters, but I tell you that it works like this, that some of the beam goes up and some of the beam goes down. And, uh, and that's it. So I make 
as, as small assumptions as possible and somebody checks it. And this, uh, my dear friends, I think is the future and thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you Martin for this nice talk. <coughs> so do you have any questions? May I ask something? Of course. First of all, I like it very much, the talk. I have a, I have a question, that's a technical question concerning this smartphone with, with a quantum uh, random number generator in it. If this is really built such that there is a laser producing light and the photo detector, then indeed photo detectors which are sensitive to single photons are easily available. Well, they cost something, but, but probably they can be uh, uh, very small now. However, lasers do not produce single photons. They are producing coherent states. And then I wonder what sort of really uh, light source is being used there. Um, so uh, actually Samsung says it's on its website. I don't, uh, I don't remember right now, but it's some sort of laser diode and the, the states which it is producing are, are definitely not single photons. They, they, they are coherent state and also the detector is is very bad detector. So, so this so is why I'm reluctant. Yes. So this is why I'm reluctant to call uh, the this uh, Samsung device a quantum random number generator, and it's certainly not a good random number generator. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I have a question. The first question is why this is so dramatically important that I, in my cell phone, I have a better random number generator that a software random gen number generator is used since I don't know how many years in the computer simulations, in the Monte Carlo simulations. We use um, the overflow, we use the overflow generators, right? And they are extremely good and at least they are perfectly checked for simulating a thermal noises. So what is special about the Samsung uh, the phones? And the other is, I mean, I, I, I really like the talk, but the question is this, you, you didn't provide any answer to the fundamental question. Why not to use radioactive source? And at one of your, uh, on one of your slides, I, I, I forgot it was a two or three slides before the finish, you finished. There, there was a drawing that finally the result is a random bits series. I mean, the, the radioactive decay generates that. And uh, if I take a radioactive source which has a half life, lifetime of a few thousand of years, then uh, the question, the, it's, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's as good as anything. And if the random process is actually the one of the, I mean, I mean, the random decay of some elements is so well separated from all possible other interactions that any attempts to, to influence the generation of these random numbers is physically prohibited. So um, the, the problem lies not in the radioactive element, the problem is in the detector. So the detector which detects uh, the radioactive decay can be faulty or can be biased on purpose by the supplier of this, uh, of this device. So it, we, it is the same. But basically, the schemata would be the same as in this picture. Instead of laser, we have uh, some radioactive material. And instead of APD, we have a Geiger counter or uh, some, something similar. But then, if somebody tampers with the electronic circuit in, st in this Geiger counter and, uh, and uh, orders it to produce predetermined uh, string of numbers from the round book, for example, there will be no way to check for this. And, uh, and uh, the problem is that this sort of attack is actually quite uh, common. Uh, okay, so we, um, so, uh, we know 
about many of the suppliers of random number generators, I showed you on a slide, which on purpose tamper with their devices in such a way that they will be able to predict the randomness generated by them. So the thing is that with radioactive decay, we don't, don't have the trust in this device unless we build it ourselves. But I disagree with this argument. I mean, the vendors can be unfaithful, I mean, manufacturing whatever device. I mean, that you are opening or you are running a company which will make the random number generators. I mean, I mean uh, honestly, why should I trust you that you will not tamper with this uh, device? So because this argument that, that look, 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 human... I will tell you, if my, my, my company is doing something else, but it will be easier to explain in this picture. If my device is composed actually of two devices and uh, they are violating Bell inequality and I give you a mathematical proof from this paper, which says that if you violate Bell inequality, and regardless of what I put in this device, then there must be this amount of randomness. Then you must accept that you're getting good randomness because the quality of it does not depend on how these devices were built. And this is the... I will have to, I will have to check that this number satisfy the inequality using some sort of electronic device. And that yes. device can also be tempered. So, yeah, I mean, but, uh, but this is a separate device. Arguments so, on cheating by humans cannot be disputed scientifically. Are we talking about the quality of a physical random number generating or about the human activities? And if you want to discuss the human activities, that I withdraw from the discussion because it doesn't lead to us to any conclusion. I mean, physically, the random number generated by radioactive decay are as pure random numbers as we can conceive. Yes, they are, but the thing is that um, we're somewhere in the middle. I want to build a device which I can, uh, which I will be able to convince people to use. And this is a little like, this is, marketing problem uh, of sorts, but we know that uh, these devices, which are based on Bell inequalities or, or this semi-device independent approach, um, they at least will make uh, putting uh, backdoors or using tro Trojan horse attacks several orders of magnitude more difficult for the potential attacker than, uh, than the ones uh, that we are cur currently using. And that's, that's it. So, there we are talking, so we are talking about the human activity, not about physics. Um, we're, we're talking about physical processes, uh, which, uh, which we use in human activities, yes. Lukas, I think that you missed the point because uh, we are talking about building uh, random uh, number generators. And there is a company who builds this random number generator and you can check afterwards whether these are numbers, uh, the random numbers with the method you, of your choice, okay? You can, you can also cheat yourself, but this is not the problem. But the problem is that you have to check that this is random, a number and they are not cheating in the way you can discover this in this way you are you are so this for your purposes it is enough so this is the problem so we are not pay, uh, speaking about uh, generating random numbers but about building random number generator may i ask a question of course yes please uh, just about the discussion between generating photons and detecting photons and getting some digital output which can be used for something you need some interface that interface may be attacked i mean your generator may be physically fine but how you 
can assure that what you are, the stream you are generating is indeed the stream which comes from photons and not from some tampering in between. Um, if I have a bell inequality, I don't really care if this, if uh, these numbers I can use to violate bell inequality. I know that they are random, and I, and uh, and I don't care who and how produced them. I. I, I really don't need this, so I don't even uh, so I don't even need to know if uh, I have photon detectors here or maybe I use entang some sort of entanglement between different types of particles. I I don't really care, and I don't care about any point in information processing. I only care about random variables a, b, x, and y. So how you can convince customers that he is getting? Uh, so I just show them uh, the proof from this paper. And uh, actually, maybe not this paper, because there are some other papers where the proof is much easier. And it's basically like 10 line proof, which tells you, OK, if you violate this bell inequality, then you get randomness. And that's it. It's no, mathematics. That I understand, but you have a device, device mm -hmm. to customer. Customer can do anything with a stream of uh, bytes which is getting mm -hmm. from the device. How you can convince him on that level? I mean, uh, classical random number generators just run all sort of uh, Maurer tests or any other tests to look for correlations in generated bits. And mm -hmm. They do it most of the time. Several three letters agencies spend a lot of computer time on that. How you can convince your customer with your device on that level of protocol? Uh, so actually, this device also passed this, uh, this uh, classical test of randomness. But here, the, the, the problem is, is different. I, I just tell them, look, if you get if you have two separate pieces of the device, which are not communicating to each other, so you can put a slab of lead between them and make sure that they are not communicating. And you can test them by choosing X and Y randomly on your own. Then if you violate bell inequality, then mathematics tell you that that A and B are random and moreover, Here's a plot which tells you how much randomness there is. And that's it. I'm, I, I wish I had a slide here with uh, the derivation for maybe because this green curve uh, can be re really derived um, uh, analytically in just a few minutes, but I don't have it right now. But this is just a simple calculation. Okay, okay, so let us thank again, Marcin, for a nice talk. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye then. Thank you. Bye.